Hey everyone, Dr. D here, and in this video we are going to be covering chapter three from our Microbiology, a Systems Approach by Cohen, seventh edition. This chapter covers tools of the, of the microbiology laboratory. So we're going to be looking at methods for culturing and microscopy of microorganisms. So let's go ahead and get started. I Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. I Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Explain stuff. We start this chapter by introducing the five eyes of the laboratory inoculation, incubation, isolation, inspection, and identification. These are terms that we need to understand when we're working in the microbiology lab. So let's go ahead and define inoculation first. With inoculation, we're talking about introducing microbes into or upon media for culture. What is media? Media or medium uh, the singular is medium, the plural is media. Media are nutrient-containing environments in which microbes can multiply. So you've seen in the lab, you have those Petri dishes with agar, you know, those they're called agar plates or TSA agar plates. These are a type of medium. And also we have broth in a tube, a test tube of broth known as TSB broth. This is a type of medium. If you have fresh medium, then you could inoculate that medium. That means you could introduce bacteria to that medium, right? So if I say inoculate your plate with E. coli, that means you take a sample, a small sample of E. coli, and use that to introduce into your fresh medium. So when when a scientist or in the laboratory setting, when we're talking about medium, we're talking about fresh medium. We're talking about a nutrient environment to grow your microorganisms. Once you have introduced or inoculated that medium, it becomes what's known as a culture. A culture is the propagation of microorganisms with various media. So if I hand you a culture of E. coli, that means I've handed you E. coli that has been already seeded inside of uh, medium. If I hand you media, that means it should be fresh and sterile and free of microorganisms. So try to keep those terms straight. Medium is typically, it refers to fresh and sterile uh, environment, nutrient containing environment. Culture, this means that it's already been inoculated with a microorganism. Okay, and again, I've been using this word sterile. What does it mean? Sterile is the gold standard in microbiology. This term refers to free of all life forms, including endospores, fungal spores, viruses, bacterium, everything. As for the next I, incubation, what does this term mean? Incubation is when a medium that's been inoculated with a particular microbe is then allowed to grow in a particular environment. So usually incubators have temperatures uh, in the 20 degrees to 45 degrees C range. Um, this is typically because many bacterium, many microbes grow in this range, especially the ones that cause human disease because the human body uh, is at 37 degrees Celsius and room temperature is around 24 degrees Celsius. So most organisms that you need to worry about if you want to go into the clinical setting are organisms that grow in this range. But that's not the only range that microbes grow. We're going to learn that they could grow in very cold environments, very warm environments. Incubators, you know, incubators, a lot of times these incubators, they look like big refrigerators, right? But they could be set to 45 degrees. They could be set to 30 degrees, 37 degrees, right? But you could also control their atmospheric gases. So you could control the level of oxygen in the incubator, the level of CO2 in the incubator. And so when, when, we, when we inoculate our medium with bacterium, we then need to place it in the proper 
incubation environment, right? So sometimes if it's a microbe from the body, we'll place it at 37 degrees for incubation overnight, right? If it's a microbe from the environment, we would place it in the 34, uh, sorry, 24 degree incubator overnight, right? And so you always want to assess the optimal growth uh, temperature and environmental conditions for the microbe that you're trying to grow overnight. And how do you assess growth? If you're dealing with a liquid medium, so let's say you're looking at a broth and you're trying to grow, I don't know, E. coli in a broth, the broth will turn from clear or transparent to cloudy, uh, sediment, scum, color change, right? And <clears throat> this is known as a turbid environment. There's turbidity. Now, microbial growth on a solid medium like a agar plate, you will see colonies show up. These are visible masses of piled up cells. And we'll talk about what goes into a colony, what, what comprises a colony in a little bit. Again, some bacterium, you can see the organisms on the left, these are different types of bacterium, prefer different temperatures for growth. So look at this, Listeria prefers about 25 to 30 degrees for optimal growth. Pseudomonas, about 25 to 30 degrees for growth. Whereas Streptococcus uh, prefers 37 and Mycobacterium prefers 37. And different microbes grow at different rates. Some microbes grow quickly, they could double every 20 to 30 minutes. And some microbes, they grow quite slowly and they take a lot longer to grow. Um, now, another thing is notice that Streptococcus and Mycobacterium, these are bacterium that are known to grow on the human body. Streptococcus pyogenes, for instance, is the bacterium that lives in the back of the throat and is typically associated with strep throat, strep throat. And so that makes sense that this is a bacterium that grows better at 37 degrees. Mycobacterium tuberculosis is the bacterium that causes TB. It causes tuberculosis. It gets into your lungs, right? And so that makes sense. It grows best at 37 degrees because your body is 37 degrees. However, Listeria and Pseudomonas are not typically part of your normal flora. That means the flora are the microbes that make up your gut microbiome and your body's microbiome, your skin microbiome. It's, these are not typically uh, human flora. And so they prefer closer to the room temperature of 24 or 25 degrees. Isn't that interesting to think about? Not all organisms prefer the same temperature for growth. And this is going to be a recurring theme throughout the course. You're going to notice that microbes are different from one another. Some, for instance, some microbes require only a few simple inorganic compounds to grow, while other microbes require a complex list of specific inorganic and organic compounds to grow. Some microbes can't even grow in the environment, in the artificial environment of the lab. Uh, so, you know, different microbes have different requirements for growth, be it temperature, be it, uh, be it gas or, you know, oxygen or CO2 levels, be it uh, nutri nutrients that they need in the media. The list goes on and on. Uh, pH, it could be pH, it could be, you know, it could be salt conditions. Uh, microbes have very, very different requirements for optimal growth. And we're going to learn about that and, and how that affects the body and how that affects disease as well. We're going to try to link those concepts. It's going to be kind of neat to learn. Now, in the lab, we use artificial media. Again, media is the, the types of nutrients in which microbes grow. We have different physical states of media. So we could have liquid media like a TSB broth, 
a semi-solid media, a solid media that could be liquefied, a solid media that can't be liquefied. All this to say there are different forms, physical forms of media in the lab. And we have different chemical composition as well. We have chemically defined media and we have complex or not chemically defined media. Let me explain this real quick. With chemically defined media, defined or synthetic media is media whose exact chemical composition is known. So if you know every single ingredient in the media, then that's known as a defined or synthetic media. Whereas the media we typically use in an introductory lab is not usually defined. It's usually a complex media. A complex media is a type of media where at least one component is not chemically definable. We don't know exactly what's in it. So for example, if I have a blood media where I've mixed blood into the plate, or I have a serum media or meat extract or infusion, milk media, yeast extract, most of our plates and broths are TSA or TSB, tryptocase soy. So we have soybean digests. Um, we have peptone. These types of things have ingredients that we're not totally sure about. So most of the media in the lab uh, is complex because we don't know like, the exact chemical makeup, the exact ingredients in that media. Does that make sense? But if we did make our media from scratch, knowing every single amino acid we added, uh, the exact uh, salts and sugars to the gram that we add, then that would be a defined or synthetic media. Now, there's also functional types or purposes of the media. There's general purpose media. There's enriched media. There's selective, differential, reducing, specimen, transport, assay, enumeration. There's so many different reasons for the media we have in the lab. But typically, we're going to start with general purpose media. And so let's talk about that first. With general purpose media, as the name suggests, it's therefore growing as many different types of microbes as possible. So the mission of this type of media is just to be a general growth media allowing for numerous different species to grow and providing a complex media uh, with a mixture of ingredients that support a wide variety of microbes both from the microbes that are more finicky to the microbes that aren't to, these include nutrient agar and broth brain heart infusions, and tryptocase soy agar. Right? This is the type of media we typically use in our TSA plates, right? And we got TSB broths. Um, our, our main plates and broths in the lab are general purpose media. We just want to grow as many different organisms as possible. Another type or purpose media is enriched media. Enriched media contains complex organic substances that you've used to enrich that media, right? So you can add blood to en enrich the media, serum, hemoglobin, okay, special growth factors. Why would you want to add these things to enrich media? Well, because some microbes are fastidious. You need to know this term fastidious. Fastidious refers to bacteria that require extra growth factors or extra uh, nutrients in order to grow. Think of fastidious bacterium as finicky bacterium. They're not going to grow unless you enrich the media, unless you add that extra growth factor or that extra amino acid or that extra you know, hemoglobin or something. Does that make sense? So for example, if you could add specific vitamins or amino acids, which would allow those fastidious microbes to grow, they're not just going to grow on any old media. Here's just a couple of examples of enriched media from your book. 
On the left, you have blood agar, where they have mixed usually sheep blood, sheep red blood, with uh, with the agar. And you can see that the microbes, they like to grow on that type of agar. A lot of times, for instance, the strep, the streptococcus bacterium from your throat, they like this enrichment. They like having that blood around for optimal growth. And here on the right, they call this chocolate agar, even though it's not made of actual chocolate. It's it's more of a, a type of blood that's been uh, uh, treated. And so it comes out with this uh, chocolate color, but there's also blood in this media as well. So you can see that by adding this extra blood, uh, these microbes have that access to hemoglobin and other growth factors in order to grow. Now let's talk about selective media versus differential media. This could be a little tricky to wrap your brain around, but it's not, um, you know, it, it ends up making sense. So let's go into this in detail. Let's start with what is selective media, and then I'll talk about what is differential media. So selective media is a type of media that contains one or more agents, agents are usually chemicals or something, that inhibit the growth of certain microbes, but they encourage a select microbe to grow. So for instance, let me give you an example, okay? Um, did you know that on your skin, you have staph bacterium, like Staphylococcus aureus, Staphylococcus epidermidis, these types of staph bacteria like to grow on your skin. In fact, they're 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 part of your skin's flora. They they grow on the skin all the time. If I swabbed your skin right now, I'm sure I'd find some staph. Um, and by the way, that's why you know it's very lo- likely to get staph infections on the skin because a resident of the skin is staph. Isn't that neat? Um, but anyway, I digress. Um, but did you know your skin is a salty environment, right? So microbes that grow on your skin, they have to be resistant to salt to some degree. And these are known as halophile bacterium, okay? And these bacterium can grow in the presence of higher than normal salt, like a 7.5% salt, uh, you know, environment. And if a microbe is not capable of growing in high salt, it's not going to grow on your skin. So let's say I want to grow, specifically, I want to try to isolate staph from your skin. You know what I could do? I could take a sample of your skin flora, right? I could take a swab of that, and I could spread it not on a general purpose plate like a TSA plate, but I might make a selective plate where I've added extra salt to the plate. So let's say I add 7.5% salt to a plate. I've added extra salt to the plate. Well, guess what? Most microbes aren't going to like that extra salt environment and they're going to not be able to grow, right? So on that plate, it's a selective plate. It selects for halophilic bacterium. It selects for salt-loving bacterium and it selects against those non-halophiles. It selects against bacteria that can't grow in salt. Isn't that interesting? So selective media prevents one type of microbe from growing and permits or selects for another type. So you're only allowing the type of microbe that you're interested in to grow. That's an example. So a high salt plate is an example of a selective media. It selects for halophiles and the selective agent, right? The selective agent is high salt. All right. Now, how is this different from a differential media? What's the difference? All right. So differential media allows multiple types of microorganisms to grow. It, it, it says, go ahead and grow, but of the, the microbes that grow, we can display visible differences between colonies or between cultures. So for instance, I'll give you an example. This right here at the top, let's look at this, le- this middle tube and this right tube here. Let's look at this real quick. 
this these are these are agar slants. These are agar slants, which have a particular sugar mixed in, as well as a color indicator. Color indicators change color, you know, based on environmental conditions. So here we're using the color indicator phenol red, which stays red if the pH is neutral and changes to yellow if the pH is acidic. So what happens is, in this case, we have a particular bacterium we put on these slants. We let the bacterium grow. And whichever bacterium can digest the sugar, let's say the sugar in this agar is sucrose, if the bacteria can ferment sucrose, well, then it will produce acid, changing the pH of the slant and changing the color of the pH indicator, phenol red. So here, if the bacteria grow and digest the sugar, the slant turns yellow. If the bacteria grow but can't digest the sugar, that means the tube remains red, right? So you don't get too bogged down in the chemistry of it. You know, I share that so that you can kind of understand how it works. It's based on when the microbe grows, does it use the sugar? This is the example on the right. Whoops. Um, does it use the sugar or does it not use the sugar? But notice this, regardless, the bacteria grew on this tube, the bacteria grew on that tube. Okay. But the only difference is if they use the sugar, the tube will turn yellow. If the bacteria can't use that sugar, the bacteria, the tube uh, will remain red. Isn't that interesting? So do you see how a differential media like these right here would be different than a selective media? With selective media, you prevented one type of microbe from growing and you selected for another type to grow. In a differential media, you invited everyone to grow, but you differentiated. You looked for differences based on color or based on some other factor, right? You were able to differentiate different types. You were able to visualize differences between microbes based on something like color. Isn't that interesting? So that's the difference between differential media and selective media. Here's another important example of a differential media, blood agar. Remember, we talked about blood agar a little bit earlier. I told you that adding blood to the, your TSA plate uh, is an enriched media. So not only is a blood agar plate and a type of enriched media, but you can also differentiate on that media as well. So the way you differentiate between microbes that grow on the blood agar are that some microbes produce what are known as hemolysins and some bacteria do not produce hemolysins. What are hemolysins? Well, hemo refers to blood and lysin refers to break. So the bacteria that produce hemolysins produce enzymes that lyse or break down red blood cells to release the iron-rich hemoglobin, which they need as a growth factor to grow. If a bacteria can release hemolysins that completely break down the red blood cells, this is known as beta hemolysis. If the bacteria release hemolysins that incompletely break down the red blood cells, this is known as alpha hemolysis. And if the bacteria is incapable of producing these enzymes, these hemolysins, well, then you should not see hemolysis on the blood agar plate. And this is known as gamma hemolysis. So let's look at some examples of each. Here you can see an example of gamma hemolysis, which means no hemolysis on the top. This is with a type of bacteria, enterococcus. On the right, you can see a, a type of strep, streptococcus called streptococcus sanguini. And notice here, this is, this, here, this is a type of alpha hemolysis. 
How do I know it's alpha hemolysis? Well, look how the agar appears bruised, almost like a yellowy brown. Sometimes it can be greenish. Um, you know, think of a bruise and notice that the agar appears bruised here. Well, that's known as incomplete hemolysis or alpha hemolysis. Whereas remember up here with gamma hemolysis with your enterococcus bacterium on the blood agar plate, notice how the blood looks great. The, here are the colonies, here are the bacteria, but notice that the agar looks great. Well, that's because the, the, the enterococcus does not produce hemolysis, and so the blood is not damaged. Whereas look down here with beta hemolysis, this, this here is an example of a bacterium known as Streptococcus pyogenes. Remember, this is the type of bacteria that grows in the back of your throat that's associated with strep throat. Well, notice how this bacterium, there's a complete lack of red, right? It, the, these are the bacterial colonies in yellow, right? A kind of creamy color colonies. And notice how the blood is totally gone around these colonies. That means that they have completely lysed all the red blood cells in their environment. And in fact, if you were to wave your hand behind this plate, you would see your hand behind the plate because now it's see-through because the red blood cells are completely lysed. And this is known as beta hemolysis. So if you have, for instance, if you have a patient, patient A, and you're trying to figure out what type of bacterium the patient has, you know, and you're comparing it to three culprits, you know, you would say, oh, it's most likely this culprit here, this patient has strep pyogenes. So again, the reason why a blood agar plate is enriched is because that blood gives extra nutrients like hemoglobin to the microbes. Uh, but not only is this an enriched plate, but it's also known as a differential plate. Why? Because of the microbes that do grow, we can differentiate gamma versus alpha versus beta hemolysis. Now, some media are both selective and differential. So let me give you an example. Mannitol salt agar plates. Here's a mannitol salt agar plate, which has bacteria already growing on it. It looks like three different bacterium growing in different zones here. You got a zone here, a zone here, a zone here. Now, can you beat Wicket? Why do you think this plate, this mannitol salt agar plate is selective? What do you think in the name suggests that it would be a selective plate? That's right, Wicked as always. The salt, right? So mannitol salt agar plates have salt Salt is selective agent that prevents the growth of non-halophilic bacteria. Those are the bacteria that cannot grow in the presence of salt. So if you see no growth, that means it's most likely not a halophile. However, this plate is not just a high salt plate. It's also a differential plate. Why? Because it looks for the use of this sugar called mannitol. Mannitol is a sugar and some bacterium can break down mannitol, some can't. And we want to we want to be able to tell which ones can and which ones can't break down this sugar mannitol. Well, do you remember this uh, color uh, indicator here that was red or yellow? You know, if the bacteria doesn't use the sugar, it remains red. If the bacteria does use the sugar, it turned yellow. Do you remember this test here with these slants? Well, that color indicator that changes from red to yellow is called phenol red. So in this plate is also the color indicator phenol red, as well as the sugar mannitol. So look at this. So here you have growth. You see this? This is the bacteria growing on the plate. So the bacteria grew on the plate. What does that tell me? And look here, the bacteria grew on the plate here. This different bacteria grew here. This bacteria grew here. Again, these are three different bacterium growing on the plate. What does that tell me? Again, can you beat Wicket? What does that tell me about those bacterium? <laughs> right, right. As always, Wicket. They are halophiles. They like salt. But look, this zone here, um, this zone here is red, whereas these two zones are yellow. What does that tell me? 
Well, in this case, again, what that tells me is these bacteria, although they're halophiles because they grew, they were not able to digest the mannitol, break down the mannitol in the agar. And because of that, if you're not breaking down the mannitol, you're not producing that acidic byproduct and you're not changing the pH to an acidic pH. Therefore, this quadrant here, this little zone remains red. Isn't that interesting? Thanks to the phenol red color indicator. But what can you tell me about these other two zones here? The, these bacteria, not only are they halophiles, but they are changing the agar to a yellow. The colonies appear yellow. That tells me something. That tells me that these microbes are also fermenting mannitol. Isn't that interesting? So again, this mannitol salt agar plate is both a selective plate and a differential plate for those reasons. Now moving on to miscellaneous types of media. What, what is reducing media? Well, reducing media is used to grow anaerobic bacteria because this type of media has a what's called a reducing agent. That means a chemical that removes oxygen from the media. Why would you want to remove oxygen from a media? Well, what if you want to grow bacteria that are anaerobic? These are bacteria that prefer to grow in the absence of oxygen. We're going to be looking at a type of reducing media this semester. It's called thioglycolate broth. This thioglycolate broth, it, it removes oxygen from the media so that you can grow anaerobic bacteria. Isn't that neat? So just because uh, some bacterium like oxygen for growth or require oxygen for growth doesn't mean all bacterium do. The anaerobic bacteria they grow better in the absence of oxygen. In fact, strict anaerobes or obligate anaerobes, some creatures are destroyed in the presence of oxygen. So if oxygen is exposed or if these microbes are exposed to oxygen, they will literally die. The oxygen will destroy those microorganisms. Isn't that interesting? So reducing media is there to grow anaerobic bacteria. And then another type of miscellaneous media is the carbohydrate fermentation media. These are, these are examples right here of carbohydrate fermentation media. Again, we're looking at a particular sugar. Each of these has a different sugar. So you could have uh, sucrose as the sugar or mannitol as the sugar or glucose as the sugar. It could be lactose, but you pick a sugar. And remember... Remember just like these slants over here, um, because of phenol red staying red or turning yellow, right? The phenol red color indicator is also mixed in. So what can you tell me? It looks like the microbe is able to break down this sugar because the tube turned yellow, right? Remember the, the tube turns yellow because the bacteria break down the sugar, the as a consequence, a acidic byproduct is formed and that changes the pH of the environment, changing the phenol red color indicator to yellow. And in this case, it looks like, oh, in this case, the bacterium were not able to break down the sugar because there was no pH change. Isn't that interesting? So we can use carbohydrate fermentation media in order to see whether bacterium break down a particular sugar. Because again, not all bacteria like to do the same things. Some bacteria are capable of breaking down glucose. Some can break down lactose. Some can break down both. Some can break down neither. It, you have to figure it out by doing these biochemical tests. Isn't that interesting? And what is the name of this little tube in here? Look, there's a little inverted test tube in this, in this uh, bigger test tube. This is known as a Durham tube, and its job is to collect gas that's produced during the fermentation process. So if I were to see these results, if I were to see these results, I would say the microbe breaks down this particular sugar and not only that, but it produces gas as it does because the gas bubble comes up and it gets collected in the Durham tube, which is an inverted uh, tiny test tube. Here you can see in the, in the uh, negative result on the right, that there's no gas production. So not only was the bacteria not able to break down that sugar, but it didn't produce gas either. Now, this is really important and interesting. When you look at a plate, you know, a TSA plate, 
on a TSA plate after inoculation and incubation, you might see colonies forming on that agar plate, right? The colonies kind of look like this on the plate. You know, this is a picture of colonies on the plate. Notice how there are white colonies here and here, and then there are these redder, red colonies over here. These are known as colonies, right? Bacterial colonies. And here's what I want you to know about colonies. When I seed a plate, when I inoculate a plate, I'm adding bacterium to the plate. And let's say I, I add a mixture of cells, so uh, two different species of bacteria. One species are these white bacterium that are spherical, um, and the other species are these rod-shaped bacterium in red. Now, the these bacterium will spread out on the plate, and they're known as the parent cells. So here's a parent round cell and a parent rod-shaped cell. Well, those bacterium spread out on the plate and they start to divide. During incubation, the growth increases the number of the cells. So the parent cell divides. And the, you remember that bacterium grow asexually. So one becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight. And because it's asexual reproduction, there's no genetic changes uh, during uh, division. So when one bacteria becomes two, those two are genetically identical to one another, right? I want you to know that those two are genetically identical. And when those two become four, those are genetically identical. And when those four become eight, all eight of those are genetically identical. So what I want you to know is this, when you come back, when you come back to the lab after, you know, doing, um, doing an experiment and you take your plate out of the incubator and you take a look at your plate, your agar plate, and you see these little colonies, this is what I want you to know. Each colony is millions of the same bacterium. And I want you to know this. Each colony started with how many bacterium? Let, let's see if you can beat Wicket to the answer. How many bacterium started each of these colonies, right, Wicket? It's one, one bacterium total, one, just one bacterium. So one spherical one started this colony and one rod-shaped one started this colony. Isn't that interesting? So, and when, when that one divided and divided and divided and divided, Remember, it made clones of itself. It cloned itself because it, it divided asexually. So what that means is, although there are millions, you see, you see the red one, the red bacterium divided to make many of itself. So this red colony can have millions of this bacterium, right, in it, but all of those millions of rod-shaped bacterium are clones of one another. And because of that, this is called a clonal population. And yes, genetically, all of those millions of bacterium in this colony are identical, okay? So isn't that interesting? Each colony was started by one bacterium. Each colony is a clonal population of millions and millions and millions of the same identical bacterium. Isn't that interesting? So this white colony was seeded by one spherical white cell, which divided to give millions of copies of this white spherical bacterium. Uh, so very important to understand. Now this leads to the next concept, the next I. Remember we're talking about the five I's of microbiology, the requirements of isolation. A small number of cells must be inoculated into a relatively large volume or expansive area of media selected to encourage growth. So for instance, you see what we're doing? Oops. We started with a broth. We started with a broth. And notice how the broth is turbid. Remember, turbid means cloudy. That tells me there's different microbes. There's bacteria growing in the broth. Now, 
when I look at a broth, I don't know if it's, you know, 10 different species of bacteria growing in this broth. I don't know if it's a pure culture, so there's only one type of bacterium in this broth. I don't know what's going on in this broth. All I know is bacteria is growing in this broth. But if I were to take some of this broth and spread it on a plate, right? Remember, after I spread it, I have the little round colonies or a little round bacterium that spread out in the little rod-shaped bacterium. And if I allow for incubation and I come back to lab, what do I see? I see the little red colonies and the little white colonies. What I have effectively done is the third eye in microbiology. I have isolated the different colonies from one another. I've isolated the different species from one another. Obviously, these white, these white colonies are probably one species of bacterium, and these red ones are probably a different species of bacterium. And do you know what I could do at this point? I could take a sterile instrument called a loop, which we'll talk about later on. I could take a sterile loop and I could use my sterile loop to just touch. Imagine if I just touched this colony here, the red colony, and then I started a whole new plate with just this bacterium. Would I have not have isolated this species and made a pure culture of just this species? Isn't that cool? And what if I took another sterile loop and I touched this white colony and I spread that on a whole new plate as well? Well, then guess what? I have isolated this species from this species. Isn't that neat? In a broth, you can't isolate different species. You don't know if there's 10 different species, 100 different species, but once you spread it on a plate in a dilute fashion and you get these isolated colonies, then you could make pure cultures. You could isolate them by separating them out onto, onto fresh media. Isn't that neat? So that's really a, a big technique that we do. We After inoculation and incubation, we can do isolation. In fact, isolation is the whole purpose behind the streak plate method. This is a type of inoculation that results in isolated colonies. And we're going to learn about this in the lab. But essentially, you take a small droplet of culture, you take a tiny bit of your mixed sample, and you spread it on the surface of the medium with an inoculating loop. So, so here's what we do, watch. Let me, let me walk you through this. You take bacterium, you spread it in this little zone with a loop, okay? Now, if you were to inocu uh, incubate, if you were to incubate this plate at this point, you would not get isolated colonies because there's so many bacterium that isolated colonies will not form. If there's too much bacteria in too little area, colonies don't form. So let me show you this first. This is called zone one. You see, this is where you put the bacterium into zone one. Let me show you zone one. See zone one up here? It's really hard to see isolated colonies in zone, zone one because they're too concentrated. So what you do is, this is the genius of this streak plate technique. You then take your metal loop, you take your wire loop here, and you flame it, right? You incinerate those bacteria. You kill all the bacteria. And then you don't touch the, the original bacteria. You, instead, this is what you do. You get your sterile loop, and then you touch zone two. This is called zone two right here. Are there any, did you introduce any bacteria to zone two? No. But what you'll do is you'll drag the loop into zone one. Now what have I done? Once I've touched the sterile loop to zone two and dragged it to zone one, haven't I picked up some bacteria from zone one? Yes, and I drag those bacteria into zone two, right? Does that make sense? So I go into zone one a few times, two or three times, but never again. And then I do it again. I, I I incinerate or flame the loop. I kill all the microbes on this on this loop. Then I go to zone three. If I touch here on zone three, did I did I introduce any bacteria to zone three? No, but I go into zone two a couple times, two, three times, and then not again. And then I incinerate the loop again, and then I do zone four, right? So now I've 
I go into zone three a few times and not again. So if this is true, which zone should be your most dilute zone? Which zone should have the fewest microorganisms or bacterium? Can you beat Wicket? <laughs> That's right, as always, Wicket. It's zone four. Zone four should have the fewest bacterium, right? Zone four should have the fewest bacterium. So let's look at what a properly streaked streak plate looks like after incubation. Zone one with far too many microbes to form colonies, zone two, zone three, and zone four. Look in zone four, beautiful separation of the different microbes. This is only uh, capable of happening if you dilute the microorganisms enough. So you can see here, you've got these nice, brilliant red colonies. You've got these little yellow colonies and these cream color colonies, you see? So it, it looks to me like there were three different species in this uh, mix. And what you could now do is take a sterile loop and subculture. Subculture means make, a, make another uh, culture from this culture. Um, subculture some of this bacterium onto a fresh plate subculture this bacterium onto a fresh plate and subculture this red bacterium onto a fresh plate. And you would have isolated those three species from one another. But do you see the purpose of the streak plate technique? It's to dilute the microorganisms in such a way that you end up with uh, these single colony. All right, another type of plating method is called the poor plate method. We're gonna do this in the lab. You're, we're going to take samples, usually samples that are diluted serially, into, into liquid agar, right? Cooled but still liquid agar. This means that the, the agar has not had a chance to solidify. It's still hot, right? And once you add the bacterium to the liquid agar, you pour that into an empty Petri dish and allow the agar to solidify. And then after incubation, you can see the bacterium in the plate and you can even count the bacterium. Um, and by the way, let me ask you this. If we are adding, whoops, if we are adding bacterium to liquid agar and then pouring it into a dish, are you only going to get colonies on the surface? Can you beat Wicket? That's right, Wicket. You would not only get bacteria on the surface, you would also get bacteria trapped in the agar. Like this little guy, see this little guy? It looks like a little star. This little guy, this little guy, these little guys. So... In a poor plate, not only do you get microbes on the surface, but you also get microbes in the agar, trapped inside of the agar because of that pouring technique. But uh, so if you have to, you know, a lot of times we'll do this for counting reasons, you know, to count the microbes. So one, one frequent mistake students do if they count these microbes is they'll just count these big guys, they'll just say, you know, if I'm counting the bacteria, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and I'm done, right? No, it, it's also, you also have to count these little guys. You have to count the bacteria colonies that are trapped in the agar. They're going to be smaller because it's hard for them to spread out when they're trying to grow inside of the agar. Does that make sense? So again, a pour plate is when we add a sample to liquid, liquid agar and then pour that and you're gonna be able to count colonies. Isn't that interesting? Compare that to a spread plate technique. What is a spread plate technique? Here you're adding a small volume of sample to the surface of an agar plate, and then using a sterile spreading tool, usually a hockey stick, to spread the bacteria around evenly. So here, again, you take your agar plate, the agar's already formed, you add some bacterium to the agar, and then you use your sterile, it's called a hockey stick, because it kind of looks like a glass version of a hockey stick. Spread that around the bacterium, and you will get colonies. Hopefully, you can see colonies the next time. But 
Obviously, this will be a little bit different than that streak plate technique, but it usually has the same purpose to get colonies. Isn't that interesting? So for the, for the exam, I would like you to know the difference between a streak plate, a pour plate, and a spread plate. These are all common techniques in the lab. And I've been using this term pure culture. This is a container of medium that contains only a single known species or type of microorganism. So you could call it a culture, right? Remember, a culture is when a medium has microbe in it. If it's a pure culture, it has only one species. If it's a mixed culture, it has multiple species. And another term for this can be anexic or free of other living things except the one being studied. So sometimes we use the term pure culture, for example, a pure culture of E. coli, or we could say an anexic culture of E. coli. And I used this term a little earlier too. Remember subculture? This is a second level culture from a well-isolated colony. Remember, I did it, let's say I did a streak plate and then I saw a colony on the streak plate, and then I said, I wanna subculture that onto a new plate. So I would just take with my sterile loop, I would just touch that one colony, and I would spread it on a whole new plate. That's called subculturing. And what is a mixed culture versus a contaminated culture? More lab vocabulary for you. A mixed culture is a container that holds two or more identified, easily differentiated species. So if I have a mixed culture, it suggests that I kind of know what are the different species in that culture. However, a contaminated culture, oh gosh, that means a culture that was once pure or mixed, but now contains contaminants, like something unidentified got in there, unwanted got in there, and now I don't know what's going on in that culture. So a contaminated culture is really what you don't want, though a mixed culture can be just fine. Now let's move on to microbial dimensions, because we're going to start talking about the size of these organisms and how a microscope allows us to see them, you know, visualize them. The dimensions of a macroscopic organism is given in terms of meters or centimeters, but microorganisms are measured from millimeters to micrometers to nanometers. So I want to really, really quickly tell you the you know metric system, explain the metric system to you so you have an, an idea of the, the scale we're talking about here. So your eyeballs, right? <laughs> Think of the average human naked eye can see down to about 0.1 millimeters. So imagine a millimeter and then imagine a tenth of a millimeter. That's 0.1 millimeters. The average human cannot see anything smaller than 0.1 millimeters. Okay, so knowing that, now what you should know is that a millimeter is a thousandth of a meter. Everyone knows what a meter is. You know, if you think about a meter stick, a meter is about three feet, you know, if you want to think about it in American units. Um, a meter is about three feet, and a millimeter, a millimeter, is 1,000 times smaller. So there are 1,000 millimeters per meter. All right, to explain this in more detail, let's head over to the board for more, you know, an in-depth discussion. So a quick introduction to the metric system. You all know what a meter stick is, right? It's about three feet long, but the metric system is a lot easier than the imperial system or the American system. With the metric system, we have scales that, you know, move by increments of 10 or 100 or 1,000, and this makes microscopy very easy. So, for instance, we all know what one meter is. It's about three feet, which is what I showed you there. One meter equals 
1,000 millimeters. Okay, so there are a thousand millimeters in a meter. Now, that means that a millimeter is a thousandth of a meter. Now, if I have one millimeter, one millimeter, that is equal to 1,000 micrometers. So the same difference between a meter and a millimeter is the same difference between a millimeter and a micrometer. A micrometer is 1,000 times smaller than a millimeter. A millimeter is 1,000 times smaller than a meter. And we could go on. One micrometer, and by the way, this is the symbol for micro, it's mu, right? It looks like a, a U with an extra tail. That's the symbol for micro. Okay, micro. One micrometer equals 1,000 nanometers. So now we know the metric scale going towards small, smaller, and smaller, right? Uh, the millimeters, micrometers, and nanometer scale. Now, why do I tell you this? Well, because you, you all know what a millimeter is, right? A millimeter. Well, microorganisms are smaller than that, right? And in fact, the, the resolution limit of your eye is about 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 millimeters. That means with the naked human eye, you cannot see any smaller than that, okay? And if you want that same thing in micrometers, that means 100, to 200 micrometers. This is the same thing. 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 millimeters is the same thing as 100 to 200 micrometers. So that means that the resolution limit of the eye, how small you, the human eye can see, if you squint really hard and look really closely, it, you can't see things that are smaller than that. But microorganisms are smaller than a hundred micrometers. And that's why we need the assistance of a microscope in order to see micrometer scale, right? In fact, eukaryotic cells, I'm gonna abbreviate eukaryotic cells here. Eukaryotic cells, on average, you've got about, I don't know, about 50 micrometers diameter, right? 50 micrometers. So if you have a eukaryotic cell, it would be 50 micrometers in diameter across, okay? Obviously, 50 micrometers for the typical eukaryotic cell, like your, your animal cell, your, your skin cell, that's half, as, that's half of what you can see with the naked eye. With your eyeball, you can't see anything smaller than 100 micrometers. Well, you're out of luck because eukaryotic cells are typically about 50 micrometers. Of course, there's a scale there, but this is the average. And, and guess what? Prokaryotic cells, I'm going to abbreviate prokaryotic cells, they're even smaller. They're only about 1 to 5 micrometers. Uh, in diameter. So they'd be like this little tiny little guy, right? The prokaryotic cells are typically 10 to 50 times smaller than eukaryotic cells. So obviously, in order to see these organisms, okay, see these organisms, we cannot use our uh, naked eye. We need to use a microscope because a microscope magnifies things a thousand times, right? Up to a thousand times with a light microscope. Now, one thing you should know too is viruses. Viruses are typically even smaller than this, right? Even smaller than prokaryotic cells. So I want you to realize that, my, that viruses are not cells. Viruses are not alive, okay? Viruses are false, far, far smaller than cells far more simple than cells, so you're not gonna be able to even see viruses with our light microscopes. You cannot use light microscopes to study viruses. They're just way too small. 
So welcome back from the board. So now you have a grasp of the difference between a millimeter, a micrometer, and a nanometer. And what you need to understand is that with a light microscope, you can visualize eukaryotic microorganisms like protozoa and yeasts, which are types of fungi. You can also visualize bacteria. However, viruses are too small to see with the help of a light microscope. So when we head to lab, when we head over to the laboratory and we bring our microscopes out, we can use them to look at every microorganism, but we cannot use them to look at small infectious agents such as viruses or prions. Those are far too small to see with a light microscope. Again, if we look at the size of things, the human eye can see down to 100 micrometers, which again, how many millimeters was 100 micrometers? Can you beat Wicket? That's right, Wicket. 0.1 millimeters is the same thing as 100 micrometers. That's about the resolution limit of the eye. So with the human eye, we can see things that are about one millimeter, you know, 0.1 millimeter or bigger, like lice or louse, the louse, the reproductive structures of bread mold, you know, these uh, spore caps. Uh, we can see that kind of thing. But anything smaller than that, you know, anything smaller than 100 micrometers, we need the assistance of a microscope. And, you know, in this realm, we have some of the larger microorganisms like protozoa, like Giardia lamblia. We have, you know, eukaryotic cells like red blood cells. And then on smaller scale, we have yeasts and bacterium like E. coli. And with the help of that microscope, we can see down to about one micrometer in you know diameter. Anything smaller than one micrometer, we have to use these very powerful electron microscopes, which use electrons to resolve the image instead of light. And you use these for the tiniest of bacteria and viruses, prions, DNA, you know, and then there are really special microscopes like atomic force microscopes that can visualize even smaller than, you know, molecules. They can look at small amino acids and individual atoms. Isn't that interesting? So it all depends, you know, the tool you use, you know, it, it really depends on the size of the organism you are studying. And so the purpose of a light microscope is to magnify that image, making it appear larger than it really is so that you can see it. So magnification, you need to know the definition of magnification. Magni magnification is how many times larger the specimen appears than it really is. And the, the microscope allows for magnification thanks to lenses, special glass lenses. These glass lenses uh, are able to weigh, uh, bend the waves of light, to bend the light rays in order to, uh, in order to magnify the image. This bending of light is known as refraction. Refraction is defined as bending or change in the angle of light rays as they pass through a medium such as a lens. These lenses in the microscope are what's called convex lenses. And these convex lenses bend the light. They refract the light in such a way that it increases magnification. It makes the specimen appear larger than it really is. And the greater the difference between the two substances, the greater the refraction. So what does this mean? This means that uh, when light travels from air, into glass, those are two different substances. And we know we're not going to go into great depth on this, but air has a different refractive index, they call it, than glass. And the bigger the difference between the refractive index of air and the refractive index of glass, the more the light bends. Isn't that interesting? Now, formation of an image 
occurs when an object is placed at a certain distance from those lenses. This is called the focal point. Depending on the size and curvature of the lens, the image is enlarged to a certain degree. This is called the power of magnification. So it's called X or times. If, if something is magnified 40X or 40 times, that means it appears 40 times larger than it really is. If something is magnified 1000X or 1000 times, it appears 1000 times bigger than it really is. And remember, it was those first microscopes that were brought to you by Van Leeuwenhoek uh, and Hook. The, the, these were simple magnifying lenses with just one magnifying lens. Later on, we developed compound microscopes with a second magnifying lens. So if you look at a microscope today, it has two sets of magnifying lenses, one set being the eyepiece or ocular, and the second set on the rotating nose piece called the objective lenses. Those are objective lenses. Here you can see the parts of the microscope. Let's learn the parts of the microscope. Um, you know, it's important to know every part of the microscope and its function. So let's go through those now. All right, let's start at the top. This is known as the ocular or the eyepiece. These are magnifying lenses. These here, each one of these, see, look right here. You can barely make it out right here. It says 10x. That means that each eyepiece magnifies the image by 10 times or 10x. And these can be adjusted, you know, they can be pushed up apart or close together. Then the next thing we have is this beefy portion of the frame of the microscope is called the arm. And this is important to know because when you pick up a microscope, you want to pick it up by the arm and the base. Down here at the bottom, this is called the base. The base and the arm. And if you're going to handle a microscope, you grab it by the arm but with one hand and by the base with the other hand. And then here we have this rotating nose piece. This, this piece rotates around and around and the little objectives, these little lenses are called objectives. Those objecti objectives can be switched around. So this is called the nose piece, uh, nose piece that can rotate. These, uh, these are lenses, magnifying lenses called objectives. There are usually four objective lenses, a, a small one called the 4X objective, also known as the scanning objective. The next one is usually the 10X objective or the low power objective. The next one is the 40X objective or the high power objective. And then the last one is usually the 100X objective or the oil immersion lens. Those are the four lenses. And by the way, the way you get total magnification is simply by multiplying the, the objective lens power by the ocular lens. So right now it looks like, if we take a close look, this is the scanning lens. This is the tiny, this is the 4X lens. And so this lens is magnifying the image by 4X, but that doesn't mean your specimen appears four times bigger because you also have to factor in the eyepiece. Remember the eyepiece magnifies by 10, this objective magnifies by four. So the total magnification of the microscope is four times 10 or 40. Your total magnification is the product of the, the objective that's in, in place and the ocular lens magnification, so 40X. And most of our microscopes have the lowest, the lowest setting is four times 10 or 40X, and the highest would be the 100X objective with the ocular lens, which would be what? Can you beat Wicket? What would be the highest magnification with a light microscope in the lab? That's right, Wicket, 1000X. Why? Because the oil lens, the most powerful lens is 100X and the eyepiece is set to 10X. So you have 1000X, 100 times 10. 
There you go. And then we also have this black stage here. The stage is the platform on which the specimen is placed. There is a stage clip here, this little thing, this little metal thing. It's spring spring loaded little stage clip. And you push the stage clip back to place your slide in the inside of this little apparatus here. And the stage clip holds the slide in place. And then you have uh, this, this is the switch for the light. This is the switch that turns the light on and off. Right below it, you have the light intensity control, also known as a rheostat. The rheostat increases the intensity of the light or decreases the intensity of the light. Below that, you have two knobs, a thick knob, a larger knob called the coarse adjustment knob, and then a smaller knob called the fine focus knob or fine adjustment knob. The coarse adjustment knob is only to be used when initially uh, focusing the microscope with the 4x objective, right? So you use the 4x objective with the coarse adjustment knob to initially focus the specimen. From then on, you use the fine focus knob, only this knob. You, you only use the fine adjustment knob when you move up to the 10X, the 40X, and the 100X. And do you guys remember a term from lab? The reason why, the reason why you only need the fine focus once you have the specimen in focus with the, with the scanner lens is because our microscopes are what's called par focal. This is a term that means what this is when the the uh, microscope is set up in such a way that all of the lenses are going to be nearly in focus so long as one lens is in focus. So when you see that term par focal, that means that once you have a specimen in focus with one lens, then it will be nearly in focus with the other lenses. Okay. And then you have these knobs here. These knobs hang down from the stage. There's a there's a one knob here and another another knob right below it. These are called the stage adjustment knobs. One knob moves the slide left and right. Another knob moves the slide towards you and away from you. This is how you move the specimen around under the microscope. Next, you have the actual light source. This is the light, the light source, the light bulb is in here. Next, you have this big lens. I don't know if you can see it here. There's a large lens that's right under the stage. See this big lens? This is a lens. In here is a lens, but it's not a magnifying lens, is it? Remember, the magnifying lenses are these objectives and the eyepiece. Those are the magnifying lenses. This big lens is called a condenser lens, and its job isn't to magnify the image at all. Instead, do you know what this does? You see the light bulb down here? The light bulb shines light, right? It just shines light. Well, the condenser lens takes that light and it directs it onto your specimen. Like it focuses that whole cone of light. It takes a cone of light from the light bulb and it focuses it right onto your specimen, making your specimen as bright as possible. So without a condenser, your, your specimen would appear very dim, right? Because not enough light would be directed towards your specimen. So that's what a condenser does. It focuses a cone of light onto your specimen. Oh, and look, your, your, um, your condenser usually has this little bar that sticks out of it. See this little bar right here that sticks out of the condenser? You could slide it to the right. You could slide it to the left. Well, that little bar that slides left, slides right, that is called the aperture diaphragm control knob. Um, so what that does is when you slide it to the right, the aperture closes. The aperture is also known as the iris or the diaphragm. And so this is known as the iris control. If you slide this bar to the right, the, the aperture closes, the iris closes, and less light goes through the condenser. 
If you slide the bar to the left, the aperture or iris opens, more light goes through the condenser. Why would you want to change the iris? Well, to improve what's called contrast. When you move the slide to the right, when you decrease the light going through the, the condenser, you improve contrast. When you open it up, it's brighter, but you, you, your, your contrast suffers, right? So what is contrast? Let me explain contrast. Contrast refers to how well your specimen stands out against the background. So if your specimen stands out really well against the background, you have good contrast. If your specimen stands out, you know, not very well, then you have poor contrast. So think about if you have, you know, black cells on a white background, that would be good contrast. But if you have light yellow cells on a white background, that would be poor contrast. One way to artificially inc inc uh, increase contrast is to limit the light through the iris. Another way to improve contrast is, by the way, staining. Have you heard of staining cells or using dyes or stains to stain your specimen? The whole reason behind staining is to improve contrast, just for your information. Next, we have the body, the body of the, of the uh, microscope. Otherwise, I think we've touched on all the important parts of the microscope. And remember, the, our microscopes are par focal, meaning once you have the specimen in focus with the 4X objective, it will remain nearly in focus with all other objectives. This is why you only need the fine focus once you have initially focused the microscope. All right, and the last of these terms to define, we've defined magnification, contrast, we want to define resolution. Resolution is actually defined in a funny way. Resolution is defined as how close two tiny dots can get before they appear as a single dot. So imagine two tiny dots getting closer and closer and closer. At what point does it look like one dot? That is when you've lost resolution. So the closer two objects can get without touching and still appear as two separate dots, that is the resolution you know, of the, of the microscope or of what you're looking at. That's what resolution is. One thing to realize too, which is kind of, you know, frustrating when first learning about the microscope is that the image that you see with your eye is actually not the real image as it should appear. It's called a virtual image. It is reversed. It is a reversed image. And that's because of how the light is bounced around in the microscope. So if you are looking at an image, you know, just realize that it is reversed due to the mirroring effect of the, of the light rays. Again, the resolution is the capacity of an optical system to distinguish or separate two adjacent small dots or objects or points from one another. The human eye has a resolution of about 0.1 to 0.2 millimeters. Microorganisms cannot be resolved by the naked eye. Next, let's talk about light and the electromagnetic spectrum. Energy can travel as waves, and these waves have different wavelengths. The longer wavelength energy in the universe are called radio waves, followed by shorter wavelength energy called microwaves, followed by even shorter wavelengths called infrared, followed by shorter wavelength called visible light. And it's called visible light because these, this range of electromagnetic energy from wavelength 750 nanometers to wavelength 380 nanometers, these are the wavelengths of energy that your eyeball can see, that your eye can res can uh, see, you know, your eye can can distinguish these wavelengths. 
anything shorter than about 380 nanometers energy, you can't see with your eye. And this would delve into the range of UV, which is shorter than 380 nanometers, then to X-rays, which are even shorter, and gamma rays, which are even shorter than that, okay? And by the way, the shorter the wavelength of energy, the the higher the energy associated with that with that wavelength. So yes, purple light would have more energy than red light because purple light is 380 nanometers and red light is 750 nanometers. And by the way, this forms kind of a rainbow, right? Uh, one way to one way to remember these colors in this particular order is to remember Roy G Biv. Red, orange, yellow, green, indigo, green, blue, indigo, violet. Roy G. Biv. And here are some effects of wavelength on resolution. If you use longer wavelength energy to resolve an image, it's going to have low resolution. If you have shorter wavelength energy to resolve an image, it's going to have higher resolution. So in theory, uh, a microscope using only red light to to um, resolve an image is going to have a poorer resolution than a microscope using purple light. The shorter the wavelength of the energy you're using to resolve the image, the more resolution you can get. Here you can see the appearance in a microscope. If you have poor resolution on the left and good resolution on the right. This may look like a single cell or a, you know, a diplo, diplo bacillus or something. However, if you have better resolution, you could tell that these are actually two separate cells. So with poor resolution, different cells can fuse. With better resolution, you can see that these are two separate cells. With eukaryotic cells, with poor resolution, you can't see any of the organelles inside of the cell, but with good resolution, you can. Now let's talk a little bit about this oil immersion lens. Remember the oil immersion lens? It, it refers to the 100x objective. This 100x objective requires the use of oil. Remember in lab, we had to place a drop of oil in the you know, on the slide, anytime we're using the 100x objective, it needs immersion oil. And that's because oil has the same optical qualities of glass. It has the same refractive index. Remember the refractive index? The more different the refractive index is, the more light bends when it hits glass. Um, you know, when, 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 uh, when it goes from one medium to another, so oil has the same refractive index as glass. So when light travels through oil and hits glass, the light should not bend. So that helps you gather more light. Let me show you how this works. If you are using a the oil immersion lens here, shown at the top, and here you have your cover slip, you know, you have your cover slip or your slide here at the bottom. If you don't use oil, you're going to have some air between the slide and the 100x oil immersion lens. If you don't have oil, if you have air, that means the light leaving the slide is bound to bend away, bend away from the objective and not be gathered into the objective, giving you less information, less less of a bright uh, specimen, the specimen's going to appear less bright, and you're going to lose information. When this light escapes out the sides like this, you see light is getting refracted away, light is getting reflected. Here light is getting reflected back. Here light is getting refracted away. This missing light, this missing this light that's not being gathered into the 100x objective is losing information. You're losing resolution. Not only is the specimen going to appear dimmer, but it is going to be less resolution, right? It's going to have much less uh, detail and resolution. When you add oil, oil takes up all the space between the slide and the objective, 
And so when 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 light travels up through the slide, it continues its straight path directly into the objective lens, increasing the brightness and the resolution of your specimen. So because oil has the same refractive index as glass, more light will gather into this objective lens, less light will be reflected, less light will be refracted away. And when it comes to light microscopes, there are four types of light microscopes to know about. Bright field, dark field, phase contrast, and interference microscopes. The typical lab microscope is usually a bright field microscope. This just uses those lenses we were discussing. However, a dark field microscope changes the image such that there's a black background and your specimen appears as white or bright. So you have a bright specimen against a black background, and this is due to a change in the condenser setting. Another condenser setting could be a phase contrast setting, which allows light that strikes the specimen to be shifted out of phase from light that does not strike the specimen, causing the specimen to have more contrast. So, it, you know, this is a type of light trick that uses the phase of light in order to increase contrast in an artificial way. And then there's interference microscopy. This type of microscope is really cool. It allows for a specimen to appear 3D using the polarity of light. Other types of light microscopes include the fluorescence microscope, which uses usually UV radiation to uh, illuminate or cause fluorescence. Confocal microscopes, which are basically a type of fluorescence microscope that allows you to see three-dimensional structures. And super-resolution light microscopes, which use two lasers. We don't need to know this type of microscopy down here in great detail, but these are all fancy types of light microscopes. The method of specimen preparation depends on what you want to see. What are your aims? Do you want to just simply observe the microorganism? Do you want to identify a, a type of microorganism or a part of a microorganism? Do you want to see movement or do you want to visualize structures associated with movement? Uh, basically, what do you want to see? That's going to determine how you prepare your specimen. So for instance, if I want to see microbes that are alive and moving, I'm going to make a wet mount. I'm going to prepare either a wet mount or a hanging drop mount where cells are suspended in a suitable fluid and you can see uh, viable cells, uh, cells that are alive, and you can see movement. For instance, I could see my little bacterium swimming around using their flagella. I can see a true assessment of their size, shape, arrangement, color, motility. Basically, if I want to see living cells... I would want to prepare a wet mount or a hanging drop mount. They're very similar, but in a hanging drop, you have even better uh, motility because the in a hanging drop, the specimen is not being smushed, you know, between glass. Uh, um, instead, the specimen is hanging from a cover slip into a uh, concavity into it like a like you could think of it almost like a little swimming pool on the glass slide. So you see here a wet mount. A wet mount is one of the easiest things to prepare in the mic in the uh, laboratory. It consists of a drop or two of culture placed on a slide and then overlaid with a cover slip. Quick and easy to prepare. The disadvantages, though, is that they can damage larger cells, it's susceptible to drying out, and you can contaminate your fingers by, you know, getting it 
uh, getting your fingers in there. Whereas a hanging drop mount, remember in the hanging drop mount, you have a microscope slide that has a concavity. It has a, I call it a little swimming pool, but it's this concavity. Then what you do is you put a cover slip, a cover slip which in what, on which the the specimen is hanging from the cover slip into the concavity, and this prevents your uh, specimen from becoming smushed. Uh, this uh, this overcomes the disadvantages of wet mounts. Next, when do I want to prepare fixed and stained smears? This is known as a smear technique. It's useful when you want to visualize bacteria under the microscope. But one thing to be aware of is during the smear technique, your bacteria die, right? So you're not looking at viable living cells. So in this case, what you do is you spread a thin film made of a liquid suspension of cells on a slide. You allow the slide to air dry, and then you conduct what's known as heat fixing, you pass the slide gently over a flame or uh, you place the slide at the mouth of your incinerator so that the so that the the bacterium are adhered to the slide the the bacteria so the purpose of heat fixing is to adhere the bacterium to the slide and to kill them that's also what kills them Important functions of heat fixing, kill the cells, secure or adhere the specimen to the slide, preserve cellular components. Next, you stain your smear, right? Staining. Why do we stain our bacterium? We stain in order to improve contrast. Staining improves contrast. It makes inconspicuous features stand out. Dyes impart colors to the cells by becoming affixed to them through chemical reactions. And here's something very important to understand. Dyes used in microbial staining can be basic or cationic or acidic, anionic. Basic dyes have a positive charge, so they are attracted to acidic, negatively charged components on this bacterial cell walls. Acidic or anionic dyes have a negative charge, so they are repelled by acidic negatively charged components on the bacterial cell walls. What this means is that the cells themselves, cells tend to have a negative charge at the cell wall. This means that if you want to stain cells, you want to use a basic or cationic dye. And most simple stains are basic. They are cationic. Uh, they will stick to the cell wall and stain the cell. You cannot use acidic dyes to stain most cells because the acidic dye has a negative charge. The cells themselves have a negative charge on the cell wall. And so acidic dyes will not stain most cells. Basic dyes stain cells. Now, what's the difference between a positive stain and a negative stain? Positive stains stain the cell itself. It stains the cell wall. It sticks to the cell and gives it color. Negative stains, they do not stain the cell. They stain the background. So by the way, yes, if you use a basic or cationic dye, you will do a positive stain. You will stain the cells, but not the background. If you use an acidic or anionic dye, that is going to result in a, a negative stain. You're not going to stain the cells. The, st the cells are going to be clear. In they're going to be colorless. They're going to be clear. What you are going to stain, however, is the glass slide. You're going to stain the background. So negative stains stain the background, but not the specimen. Positive stains stain the specimen and not the background. 
Here you can see an example of positive staining here, and on the right you have negative staining. Take a look here. You're using a, uh, looks like a purple dye, and here you're using a basic stain, and look how the basic stain stained the cells purple, but it did not stain the background. Now on the right, you can see an example of negative staining. This purple stain stained the glass background, but it did not stain the bacterium. This is known as negative staining. Acidic dyes will do negative staining. Basic dyes will do uh, positive staining. Some examples of very common basic dyes in the lab are you know, crystal violet, methylene blue, safranin, and malachite green. Whereas in the negative dye, a common one we're going to use is India ink. Now when it comes to simple stains, this is when we require a single dye. It's an uncomplicated procedure where we just want to use one dye in order to see basic cell shape and arrangement. So here we, we've used crystal violet basic dye in order to stain E. coli purple. And you can see these E. coli are rod-shaped cells, also known as bacillus-shaped cells. And here we can see these are trichomonas uh, type of bacteria stained with another basic dye, methylene blue. So these are both types of simple stains. Simple stains usually use a single dye, and the purpose of a single, uh, sorry, simple stain is to see shape and arrangement of the bacteria. And you just want to stain all the bacteria. Compare that to a differential stain. Differential stains use two differently colored stains, usually two differently colored stains, to clearly contrast cell types or cell parts. So when you want to differentiate between different types of cells, you can use differential cells, uh, differential stains. So for example, uh, in a gram stain procedure, which is differential, you can differentiate between what are known as gram-positive bacterium versus gram-negative bacterium. In an acid-fast differential stain, you can differentiate between acid-fast bacterium and non-acid-fast bacterium. In the endospore stain, you can differentiate the endospore-forming bacterium from non-endospore-forming bacterium. In the capsule stain, you can differentiate capsule-forming bacterium versus non-capsule-forming bacterium. Now, you don't know what gram means, uh, what a gram-positive or a gram-negative bacteria is yet. We haven't covered that, but there are two main types of bacterium, the gram-positive bacterium and the gram-negative bacterium. And this is based on the structure of the cell wall. Gram positives have one type of cell wall. Gram negatives have a different structure of their cell wall. And based on this difference in the cell wall, these bacterium turn out differently color uh, in the you know gram stain technique. Bacteria with the gram positive cell wall architecture end up purple at the end of the gram, cell, um, gram stain technique, and bacterium with the gram negative cell wall architecture end up pink at the end of the gram stain technique. So you can see purple and pink cells. The purple cells are gram positive in their cell wall architecture, and the pink cells are gram negative at the end of the gram stain technique. Same thing with acid fast. Um, some bacterium are considered acid fast if they have certain mycolic acids in their cell wall, and other bacterium are non-acid fast if they lack these mycolic acids in the cell wall. But you can do a differential stain to see the difference. The hot pink cells, the fuchsia color cells, 
these are acid fast cells and the blue cells, the light blue cells are the non-acid fast bacterium. Endospore stain. These allow you to see the endospores in one color, sometimes pink, but usually in green, and the vegetative cell, which means the mother cell, in a different color. Here it's in blue, but usually it's in pink. Okay, so the endospore stain allows you to see the endospores of endospore-forming bacterium. So you can see here that differential stains allow you to differentiate between different types of bacterium. So moving on to special stains, we can we there's special staining techniques. So for example, I could use stain techniques to see the capsule, if a bacterium has a capsule or not. And we're going to talk about what a capsule is, but it's this structure on the outside of certain bacterium. We could even use special stains in order to see the flagellum, you know, the flagellum that allows bacterium to move. So here you can see the capsule stain. This is a this is a capsule stain and these bacterium have capsules. The capsule stain is a really inter interesting type of stain. It's actually a differential stain even though it's not using two different colors. But the the reason it's a differential stain is because it allows you to differentiate between capsulated and non-capsulated bacterium. The basic dye that's used stains the bacterium. See, you see these dark structures right here, right here, right here, right? These are bacterium. The basic dye stains the bacterium. There's also an acidic dye that's used in the capsule stain. The acidic dye stains the glass, the background. But what are these little halos then? You see these little halos? These little halos are the capsules. Isn't that interesting? The reason the capsules do not stain and remain as halos is because the capsules are what's called non-ionic. Non-ionic means it's not going to attract the basic dye and it won't attract the acidic dye either. So it remains colorless. So if you see little white halos around your bacterium, these are capsulated bacterium. If there are no little white halos, just dark bacterium on a dark background, then those are going to be non-capsulated bacterium. Isn't that neat? Lastly, another type of special staining technique is the flagellar stain. Different bacterium may or may not have flagella these tiny slender filaments used by bacteria for movement. You can see here, this bacterium has tons of flagella around the, the perimeter of the bacterium. It's called peritrichus, which means surrounded by flagellum. Well, normally you cannot see these flagellum. Bacterial flagella are too thin to be visualized uh, with the light microscope. However, with this special staining technique, you basically thicken these flagellum up to the point where you can see them. Does that make sense? So um, during flagellar staining, we coat the flagella in order to see flagellated microbes. And that's it. That leads to the end of the chapter, chapter three. What an interesting chapter. A lot of this will be fleshed out when we actually do this stuff in the lab. We're doing a lot of these techniques in the lab, so you'll have a chance to see this firsthand. But I hope it made sense. Let me know in the comment box below if you have any questions, and I'll catch you guys for chapter four. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D.